All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, as we kick this off, I'm, I'm going to assume that most everyone here already knows a bit about Apollo. You are in the Discord. Um, if there is anyone new and they don't know anything, so we need to cover something in more depth, feel free to ping us on the AMA questions channel, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more in depth. Uh, today we have with us, of course, Matt Johnson, one of the, the co-founders of Apollo Enu. And uh, if you've seen any of the other, other interviews with Matt, uh, you've probably learned a little bit about Matt and his journey and why he decided to, to start Apollo Inu. Um, but let's talk about that together here with Matt now. Matt, how you doing? Hey, good. How are you doing tonight? I think the question was revolved around the inspiration or kind of what started this token. And really, it was driven from this passion of having a son that's getting ready to graduate from college and going out into the music industry. And for years, you know, him finding his place in as a creative where he fits in both community and finding opportunities and jobs where he can make money um, as being an early uh, creative getting established was, was always kind of a challenge. Give me a and I'm going to restart Discord and I'll jump back in. And uh, with that challenge, he, it really became kind of this inspiration for us of like, well, there's got to be a lot of other people like him. And about the time last year, in April, about this time, about a year ago in April, we started investing in crypto and learning about blockchain. Uh, Apollo Ted here is in the, in the crowd as well, who uh, is our lead product and tech dev. Um, just started really diving in and understanding, you know, what are community projects doing? Like what, what use cases are there? What are DAOs? Uh, we we built a lot of products and worked in a lot of companies in tech over the last 30 years, but this is kind of a new space to us. And once we kind of saw some of the cool stuff people were doing on the community side and um, with DAOs specifically, we got inspired to write our own token. And, um, you know, we put that out there, as, as everyone knows, in mid-April and just uh, received a tremendous um, response to it. So really has inspired us to look at all forms of creativity and look at ways that we can inspire and help these people and more than just even money that's coming from our DAO, which is our main utility here, as people will vote on creative projects each week to receive certain money from this DAO. Um, you know, it's about community and about them finding a place where they can all uh, connect, network and get feedback from people that you know, can help them grow and can help them uh, figure out how they win these contests and maybe enable that dream as they move forward. Hey, Matt, I'm back on now. Great. Can you hear me okay? I can. Thank you. All right. Great. Uh, it was, uh, it was a, a me issue, <laughs> a user failure. I, I forgot that I had, <laughs> I had muted the, my Discord tab to prevent all of the notifications that I get throughout the day pinging. And so that was literally it. So I'm awesome. here. Thank you for taking it away at the beginning. No problem. Um, so you let's see, so we have a number of questions that we've gotten from the community in the AMA, uh, as well as, you know, we have some other topics that we could talk about upcoming um, uh, events coming up as far as the voting and the DAO. Uh, what, what would you, where, where would you like to start? Do you want to hit some Discord questions first, or do you want to talk a little bit more about creators? Yeah, I mean, e everybody knows, like, I've heard a lot of comments in our Telegram that we're, like, the most chill community in, in crypto, and I love that. And part of that is, I think, my personality is much, let's just get to the brass tacks of things, right? I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to spin a bunch of stuff. I don't want to hype a bunch of stuff. I know people have got real questions and concerns, um, you know, in a, in a very volatile and you know, evolving space. And, you know, we, we hope to just continue to earn that trust and prove ourselves every day that, you know, we know what we're doing. And, you know, even when we mess up, we're going to let people know, honestly, you know, what we did and how we're going to fix it. So I, I'd, I'd like to jump into the questions. And then if we feel like those questions are exhausted or not covering everything, maybe we can hop into some of the stuff that we feel, um, you know, is, is important or upcoming on the horizon, I'm sure everybody's going to want to hear about some of the, the stuff coming in the next couple of weeks, which is uh, pretty exciting. So, Okay. Uh, we have a, a few questions around the team. 
and who they and who they are and their dedication to the project. We have a couple of sure. questions, general questions about uh, what inspired you to get started. I know we've talked about that a lot on other yeah. AMAs, and then we have a few questions uh, around marketing and influencers. Sure. Um, so let's uh, tell me uh, more about the dev team that's behind Apollo. And of course, we know we, we keep calling it dev team, but there's a lot more people besides just the developers on the, on the Apollo project. Right. Are they working on this full time? What's what's uh, yeah. where do they yeah. come so from? How do you we, know them? <laughs> yeah, all great, all great questions. Well, I mentioned Zach already, uh, Apollo Ted here in the in this chat, and we could definitely ping him in if we got some deep tech questions about the platform or anything that's going on there. Uh, but, you know, he's kind of been my right hand man through this. There, there's other people that are, are behind the scenes as consultants and, and advisors, like as, you know, being in industry for 30 years, when they learn that we're doing a project or getting into a new space, because we've been in, you know, right as the web was starting and PC development, I'm kind of dating myself there, you know, as mobile development, um, I was a partner building one of the largest, most successful uh, mobile app development companies in the world. Uh, so when you get into something that's, that's new, everybody's watching, everybody's looking, right? So I got plenty of people that are excited about the space that we've been teaching and learning and bringing in as investors. Um, and those people are great counselors in terms of how, how do we build the right product to the right team at the right time with the right team at the right time. So they've helped us source a lot of people and a lot of them are donating their time to help, uh, make sure this, this effort gets off on the right foot. Uh, which is invaluable to us, but then there's the people that are they're grinding it out all day. And of course, Paulo Ted, who leads uh, uh, product and development, Zach McCrary, he's docs. Uh, we all know him. Uh, we have this great uh, creative director, which um, you know I'll talk about uh, at the end. Who's done all the website? Uh, he's on it pretty much full time. I mean, he he has some other work and initiatives that he does, but um, he, he's really been instrumental in helping us get the brand and the vision and the UX. So he's working on both the website side. He's done some marketing and promotional stuff for us, you know, as we start to get that engine ramped up. And, uh, you know, he's also, um, you know, doing a lot of the UX review and work as we get ready to launch our beta product next month. So looking at the user experience and the flow there is, is really important to what we do because we come with, we come from companies that put UX first, right? And I think I've seen a lot of, uh, dApps and things in in this space that are really kind of clunky and hard to use, and part of that is just crypto and wallets and challenges for getting stuff into wallets and into dApps and things like that and security. But I think there's also ways that we can innovate and and evolve that uh, space. So so he plays a very important role in that. Um, you know, beyond that, we have a, what we call a community outreach team. That's three people that are really focused on helping us uh, start to develop out our Reddit side that are doing some of the videos, like that great video you see on our website that gets the hype going for creators, because that's where we're going to focus a lot of our marketing on. Uh, I said from the beginning, we're not going to become a, a hype engine or a pump engine. Uh, we're all about product and, and focusing on that first. But we realize that in parallel, a lot of those marketing efforts have to start now. Um, because when we get ready to start soliciting great creators to our project and bringing eyeballs and attention to it, once we deliver, um, you know, we don't want to be behind the curve. So we understand that has to work in parallel now. So that team's doing some, some great work, both currently uh, on some of the tactical stuff, but also strategically for what's to come in April. Um, we're also talking to some other professional groups that could support, uh, you know, all those efforts on the PR uh, front and social fronts which we realize is kind of an instrumental and foundational component to everything crypto is what do the communities look like? Uh, I want to give a big show, shout out to Noah ETH there as well. He's, he's built up kind of this uh, discord community and got a lot of the structural stuff in place and put together this, um, this AMA, which I think is great for us to start to lean in more on discord and improve that community as well. So he's Noah's part of that team as well. Uh, some great guys over on the Telegram side um, that some people probably know. Cody, uh, you know, is one of them. And uh, Dark, uh, Justin, <laughs> I was thinking of his handle. His name is Justin. Uh, have been aw awesome in terms of supporting us on that side. Uh, then we have, you know, your typical operational teams, finance, legal, uh, you know, that are that are working hard on that front. A lot to, lot to accomplish on that, especially dealing with the sheer amount of exchanges that we're bringing on board, it seems like weekly. 
Um, you know, and then engineering under Zach. I mean, we have one full time guy that's that's working on the Web three. Um, you know, kind of interface with all the smart contract uh, code that Zach has written and QA, as well as another part time developer that's just a rock star that's come on in the last couple of weeks to help make sure that we get all those things like unit tests and edge cases taken care of and start to look at the architectural structure of this so we can move to kind of my grand vision of having multiple concurrent contests running, um, you know, uh, across different genres. So that's a lot, lot long winded. I'll pause and, and let you kind of <laughs> redirect me here. Yeah. That, that, uh, it, that actually makes me think of uh, something that I was curious to know. So we know that you've been in the industry for 30, 30 years. You've worked in on the web, you've done a lot on mobile uh, and you've been successful at those. What, how do you make the decision to step into something brand new like Web3 and crypto uh, and take on that challenge? Like, wh why, why do you, how do you decide to, one, leave what you kind of know I, I, and are comfortable with, but also right. and start, some, start in this new facet of the industry? Um, what, 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 what were you thinking? Like, what... <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what my, you did, did my wife post what this question? I, I think yeah, I think I my wife might have posted this question, but no, I, you know, look, looking at all those nascent spaces that I lin listed, whether it was, you know, some of the early multimedia development, whether it was web, whether it was mobile, there's always just kind of been this entrepreneurial entrepreneurial spirit of like when I came out of college that there wasn't a lot of rules established for you know writing software in in that form or capacity, right? So it's like figured out at that time it was books and it became the web and it became just, you know, meetups and things like that. But I love that spirit of, you know, that clean sheet of paper and we're just going to write the rules and we're going to figure it out. And, you know, this space has been great because there's a lot of people and a lot of other tokens and projects that have really done a great job of just jumping into the deep end. And I think that's just how you're wired as an entrepreneur, right? It's to me, it's exciting to to not know all the answers, to not have all the rules figured out and to, to jump in there and and learn like you know, it, that's just that that's what kind of fuels me, um, you know, from the, the passion side of, of things in career. And part of it is we've just been successful in those spaces. So it's like I think you apply the same principles that you've learned to each iteration and find the right time to enter the market. Like, I don't, I don't think five years ago would have been the right time to, for us to enter this. I was really wrapped up in AR and VR. I thought that was a really cool and emerging space. And, you know, it hasn't scaled the way that anyone thought it would be. But I also think that when you're an entrepreneur, you know how to pivot and to find the new things and, and really this space, uh, I got really excited as an investor and, and then figured out, well, you know, it's like chocolate and peanut butter. This fits with, uh, you know, some of my clients and some of the projects we are working on. And I see a great opportunity for this to be mixed with, you know, this idea of revolutionary finance for the first time that's been etched in stone for thousands of years about how we exchange value. And being able to be a part of something that disruptive just, just really got me excited. What what do you think it's going to take for web this term and idea of web three to become commonplace and everyday for you you know for my mom and and for uh, yeah just the everyday user. Well, once it's transparent to the everyday user, I mean they they've become. Um, sorry, one second. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, sorry. It looked like it glitched out for a second. Yeah, I mean, I, I think users have become um, used to certain, you think about when the iPhone came out. You put that in front of my mom and it, it was probably very confusing. And, you know, it wasn't a feature phone. All you, all you had was a few buttons or a couple of clunky games or something that you play on it. But basically you had to learn a new interface from the ground up and touch and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is no different. I mean, I think it's gonna be a little bit easier because they're used to the web and pointing and clicking and now tapping and things like that on, on touch devices. But we have to get over this challenge of how difficult it is to get fiat in to crypto mm -hmm. and how difficult and scary it might be to connect a wallet to adapt. Um, yep. But then it, it's a large responsibility on the UX experts to say, 
how do we teach people on the front end? So every project should have the responsibility of being a teacher about crypto, in my opinion. A lot of them are just kind of hinging on, you know, hey, they'll figure it out, which in our experience in both game development, you, you literally have 15 seconds in a game for a person to decide whether they're going to stick with it or not. Like that right. is trial by fire. And I don't think that's much different in crypto because there's an element of like security and they're, they're uncertain and they're scared. They don't want to lose their money. Right. So it's a big challenge. There's no doubt about it. But I think this is the right time for the people to enter the markets that are UX experts instead of just ones that want to capitalize, uh, you know, on a quick investment turn. All right. Well said. Yeah, I, I think most of us here, if, if for anyone that's been in uh, crypto or especially in the DeFi world, we probably have gone through those speed bumps of how difficult it is to onboard and I've probably lost money uh, doing it. Sure. Um, I, I think that's part of being an early adopter. But yeah, I, we're, it's going gonna, it's gonna to need to be a lot smoother to, to onboard sure, I people agree. at the middle of that, of that adoption curve. Let's um, talk about something more technical. Okay. I haven't heard many people talking about when they're discussing Apollo Inu. Uh, I want to talk about the token, and I want to talk about the tokenomics and how okay. you come up, how you come up with the ideas of of, of how to design a token, uh, about issuance, about you know, as far as Apollo Inu goes, you know, we have reflection, we have burn, right. and then we have passing it off to the to the creator fund. Tell me a little bit about thinking about the process of of how of designing the mechanics behind a token. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of that starts with the inspiration of looking at pieces of what a lot of other people are doing, all great tech, especially the movement towards, you know, open source over the last several years, which I think blockchain is kind of solidified as being the next great thing we spent years building uh, protected ip and filing for patents and <laughs> making sure all of our code is you know shielded in the right ways and now we've had to kind of completely have a paradigm shift of on that thinking of you know trust is built by transparency and we need to show all that and you know that that has allowed us to look at other projects and learn from it at a much more rapid pace than we might have been into in, in, in other spaces, right? Um, so looking at other contracts, learning from that, going through the process, uh, you know, with Zach and, and, and really learning the ins and outs of mechanically how this works and understanding it fundamentally at how it works was really important. We, we, we're very big on understanding what does the code do. It's not good enough to just pay, copy and paste something from one contract to another. You, you really have to understand fundamentally how it's functioning. And then, of course, as, as, you, as you can appreciate, like, how does it support the use case? We don't want to add features that don't ultimately support what the token is about. And in the case of Apollo, it's really about building community and, and rewarding community for participation. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's a, it's a utility. It's basically a voting or governance token, whether it's voting on new DAO code to be implemented or whether it's voting on new creators to uh, join a prize fund, um, you know, that that's the kind of stuff that we design the tokenomics to kind of support. I mean, reflection, I mean, I, I hear both sides of this argument, but to me, that's like, wow, if, if you can always feel like you're making money while you sleep, that satisfies the stakeholder that's interested in Apollo as you know, something that can grow in value for them uh, at some point, right? Um, mm -hmm. And to see that happen always as volume increases, that's very attractive. And one interesting thing we did um, in thinking through this of how do we plus one every feature that we're doing, right? Because that's just how we work, was, okay, we see a lot of reflection tokens, but it seems like the burn wallet, especially when you, you do an immediate burn of a significant amount uh, before you provide liquidity and start the market, like that's absorbing most of those reflections. So how, what real value is that? So we right. plus one to say we're going to, most of them we were seeing were like one, 2% reflection. We said, let's go to 3% per reflection and let's exclude the burn wallet. So all can that you, 3% tell, is, yeah. Can you explain a little bit on the technical side? Like yeah. how does reflection actually work? Because okay. I, this, yeah, is my this is my understanding yeah. and what 
uh, every holder of Apollo may see. So you have a hundred Apollo tokens in your wallet. Right. You do absolutely nothing. You check back days later, and you have a hundred and one. Yeah. But how does you know, how do how do you get that other token without it being airdropped or initiated by by you or the team? Yeah, I think this is a great one. It looks like he just stepped up to the stage, but maybe Apollo Ted. I keep calling him Apollo Ted Zach. Uh, yes, can you hear maybe me? one Zach can take and talk about kind of the it gets pretty deep in terms of like how the lists store the different values and things like that. So I don't know how deep you want to go, but okay. uh, I'll let you take this one, Zach. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, so traditionally with ER20 ERC20 tokens, um you can let's just take like the balance of function. That's like a basic function um that you have to have for ERC20. In in older tokens, or I guess in most tokens, uh, all it does is it checks a mapping from your address to an amount. So say like I hold a thousand ETH or WEETH, whatever, um, it would check my address as the key and it would pull up a balance. But now with reflection, um, there's this awesome idea of you're actually gaining tokens. But the tricky thing is how do you make it so that you're gaining tokens without actually having to move numbers around and um, writing to the chain, which is expensive. Um, so now your balance of function for most accounts, other than you know the burn and liquidity pair, what you have is you have a, a reflection amount. And when you're looking at the balance, you do your reflection amount divided by the current rate. And the current rate is the total R tokens divided by the total supply. This is kind of simplified. Um, mm -hmm. And so how reflections work is every transaction, you subtract from that reflection total. And so now that you're subtracting from that reflection total, your rate is getting smaller. So now when you check your balance, um, your R amount divided by the current rate, that's always going up because the reflection amount is always going down. And Everybody so, get that? Um, there will be a test. <laughs> yes. So, okay. It, it, and that's awesome. Thanks for the explanation there. And bringing it up one level, I mean, I, I think as you see it from a, a user standpoint, um, the larger the amount of holdings that every transaction that someone transfers, buys, or uh, sells Apollo, that 6% tax is taken out. So three half of that tax basically gets sent back to everybody that has a wallet with Apollo in it. And the, the majority of that tax will go to uh, the largest holder and then proportionately down to the smallest holder. Mm. Gotcha. So reflection, some people think reflection is like, hey, everybody gets 3% of that every time that a transaction ha uh, happens, but it's a weighted uh, redistribution. That okay, I, I see. Yep. Very cool. Okay, I, I want to talk about burn and go through that one a little bit, but sure. uh, Apollo, Ted, are you going to hang around up here for us? Yes, sir. Because right, the other thing I want to know from you is what does Apollo, Ted mean? Where, where did this name come from? So that's that's an age old question. Um, when I was younger, I uh, was playing NCAA football, and I had a character that I didn't want to have be my actual name. So I went to like some random name generator or something, and it came out with the names Ted, and then the other name was Yetis. And so that's like when I go to restaurants or whatever, just to be kind of dumb and silly. If they ask for a reservation, I make it under Ted. So. That's like my name across like games and whatever, and so I just added to Paula to the beginning. Okay, I guess that makes sense. Uh, yeah, it does yeah, it's, in it's this web theory world. Think, yeah, I wouldn't uh, think, but you know, I, I I've just been reading your name, Apollo Ted. I see this little dog with a top hat, and it looks like he's made out of just like a bunch of hair or something. So, okay, but thank you for explaining that. Uh, let's talk if about if you want to know my my origin story, it comes from yeah. my parents. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Matt Johnson, I can see that. All right. Johnson, very common last name. Matthew, very yeah. common first name. 100%. They, they did not know about the, the, um, the upcoming domain name battles yeah, for, for sure not. people with, with common names. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let's talk about burn. So we have a 2% burn in, for the Apollo Enu token on every transaction. Uh, Initially, when the project started, there were two trillion tokens, and immediately okay. one trillion were burned. And now, 
with every transaction, 2% is being burned. So th we talked about reflection. 3% is being reflected back to token holders. 2% right. is being burned. So the total supply is reducing with every single transaction. Right. If Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's what, the concept. What, why do we... Yeah, go ahead. So tell, yeah. us, tell us why burn and what does that mean to, by having that reduction of total supply? Yeah, and, th and this gets back to the basics of supply and demand and basic economics, right? It's the idea of you have less of supply and uh, it becomes more valuable over over the time when it's less supply. <laughs> so, you know, the idea is like the, the U.S. government, for example, continues to print money and makes it our U.S. dollar inflationary. So they just create more and more supply, um, which devalues the dollar over time, uh, you know, with this space i think one of the unique tools that you have is you can actually reduce that supply so that's what we're doing with the two percent so i think and correct me if i'm wrong um zach but um we've burned about uh, after that first initial 50 percent another eight percent of circulating supply has been burned through transactions uh to date is that right yes sir that's right yeah that's and over eight so essentially, you, you, you really can't notice it, uh, you know, at, at this early stage, but eventually it, it's making the token more valuable based on the, the formulas of supply and demand. Uh, so, you know, over time, I mean, it's just percentages. So you're never going to get to zero. Some people think, well, what happens when you burn your entire supply? The numbers just get smaller and smaller. And kind of like Bitcoin, you, you have, you know, one small fraction equals a dollar of that. And, you know. Right. If, you know, if if the world wills it, maybe, maybe that's what Apollo will be someday. But, you know, I, I think once you get into having a DAP uh, or an ecosystem of projects that use a, a token and they're moving it back and forth and lots of people are voting and awards are being given and small pieces are being burned as you uh, move tokens all around that ecosystem, that adds up pretty quick, especially when you, you get a significant number of holders. Mm -hmm. I find it really interesting just the capabilities that we have with these financial uh, assets. I don't maybe I shouldn't call it. I don't know what I, what I should legally call it. Uh, but you know, when we have we have, we have things like Bitcoin, we have Ethereum, we have um, Apollo Inu. So like Bitcoin, there's the the total fixed supply will be 21 million, mm -hmm. no more, no less ever. Uh, Ethereum has no theoretically has no cap on how many there could be but with the latest implementation of the the burn it most likely will not exceed uh, what people are guessing is around 120 million token, right. ethereum tokens so apollo inu is interesting because it has that max limit for how many tokens will be in circulation but it also has that continual burn right um Tell me if I'm thinking of this correctly. If if we're constantly burning, if we're burning on every transaction, theoretically, does that mean that the the value of the token goes up during every transaction if we're reducing the total supply? Theoretically speaking. Yeah. Uh you, you probably won't be able to notice it much because it doesn't, you know move that fast but when you have a, a ton of volume i mean it, that that could be noticeable over you know a period of weeks or so i mean so i can probably answer answer the mathematical question of that better than i can but uh i, I think the answer would be in a small way yes and on, on every transaction yeah i would say in the most practical sense um you can think of it as okay the less tokens that are in circulation the less tokens that can be sold back into a liquidity pool so right. it's, it's I guess at the, in the slowest sense, it's raising the floor of Apollo. Gotcha. Okay. Let's uh, let's step over to the the final one percent of transaction tax, the creators <laughs> fund. So we're sending every transaction. We're reflecting three percent. We're burning two percent. One percent is going to the creators fund, which is going to be what the funding that we give out to creators. Uh, where at, where, where is that one percent going right now, and who has control of it? Like, and how much has been raised so far? Yeah, all great questions. Um, start at the top. Like, wh where is that tax going right now? So, we renounced, or 
I'm not going to use the word renounce. There are no administrative level functions to change any of the tax or values on the main token contract, which we felt like was important when we did all our research. People just don't like things changing on them. And, you know, as developers, while we can appreciate um, <laughs> the fact that sometimes it's comfortable to be able to change some things and you would like to build trust enough in the community when you're starting out, that's just kind of an important thing to do. There is one variable in there that can be changed, and that's the address of the DAO contract. And the DAO, as you may know, it stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, or it's basically a a smart contract or program wrapped around it that allows uh, the community to vote on the features and functions uh, that get implemented for the use case. So that's what we're working on right now to deploy this uh, creators contest uh, next month. But right now that smart contract exists in an early iteration or early, early phase that the, that the token contract points to. So just like the burn tax goes, uh, or the reflection tax goes back into everyone's wallets, the burn tax goes into a dead wallet or burn wallet. The 1% goes into this other smart contract, which is the DAO. And then every time that there's a voted in a new DAO update, that a function basically moves the entire balance of that treasury to the new DAO, right? So that money just moves with the DAO updates um, as it comes out. And I think your second part of that question was, um, well, remind me what your second part was. Uh, let's see. I think it was how much has been raised so far so far for the creators contest. Yeah, currently I believe we have a little over $4 million that has been raised in the first, let's call it 90 days or so. So, uh, you know, we're pretty, we're pretty excited about that. That's going to give us a lot to work with and a lot of directions to go as we scale the platform, but also make the award prizes pretty significant for the creators. So uh, we're working out all the, the kind of the final algorithms and edge cases and things like that to make sure it's fair and balanced and, you know, we'll go through a beta. That's when we'll get the first money away. I'm not saying that that will be the end all be all formula for distribution. And that is the part that we can change. So as we vote new DAOs in and propose, you know, new contracts that will change those values, we can uh, adopt that. But it's important that that is a community a voted thing. That's not something that us as any kind of centralized authority can change. We're just a part of the community when it comes to that part, just the part that's leading the charge on the development side. Gotcha. And okay, let me step back just a moment. Uh, let's yeah. see, you said uh, around the smart contract with the token and the transaction taxes and something about locking it down. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to go back and change the reflection to, to 2% and the burn to 10% or anything no. like that? No. Those taxes okay. are set in stone. Um, we, okay. we can introduce uh, creative ways that we can use that 1% that comes into the DAO. Mm -hmm. uh, but but the hard taxes within the token contract are locked and cannot be changed. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um, okay, so why Ethereum? There's a lot yeah. of yeah. a lot of talk about these other layer ones um, that are faster, faster transactions, mm -hmm. uh, cheaper to use, are better for the ecosystem of earth and, sure. and don't use as much energy like why ethereum yeah i think it's a combination of you know it's it's where we learned it's the first tokens we invested in and i think that's where most of the kind of core functionality of uh what we wanted to come insecurity of what we wanted to accomplish for our initial use case really lied we did look at some things like uh zach you might have to remind me um uh, as a layer Solana. two solution. Yeah, Solana, yeah. Polygon. Polygon, Ethereum. right. Uh, and things like that. And as we got into them, they kind of felt a little bit like still emerging, not like all tech in this space isn't still emerging. But we, we found it kind of clunky. And, and one of our big things, as we talked about earlier, is user experience. And it's hard enough to get someone on Ethereum, but then if we have to make a couple of more hops or different kind of ways to move money across bridges, at least for this initial thing. Um, you know, we felt like we just needed to go simple. And, and I've said on many AMAs already, it's just like the Amazon method, like let's build the simple thing first. And while it might have challenges, whether it be higher gas fees or things like that, I want it to be secure and simple and the easiest path for people to get into. 
And ETH is where a lot of the, you know, people that can support that growth and development, you know, play and where they exchange coins. And that's not to say that, you know, we can't bridge and that's not an idea down the road. And, you know, I'm not going to get into too much speculation about that. I think too many tokens are promising a million different things on technology that's really not established itself as stable yet. Uh, but that that's just really where, where we picked and, and felt the most comfortable in, in bringing us to this. And, you know, we've been actually pleased the last several weeks, it seems like. I don't know whether it's just the NFT craze settling down a little bit or something like that, but gas seems to have subsided uh, significantly. And, you know, everybody clings onto this promise of uh, proof of stake in E2.0. I don't know. Who knows? But, you know, one thing is when we pick a lane, we stick to it and we finish it and we learn. And then if we need to go to another lane, we will. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And personally, I love Ethereum myself. And, uh, yeah, the ETH merge is projected for the summer. Uh, you know, they've been talking about ETH, too, since 2016 or 2017. Right. But it might actually happen now. Uh, one thing to note, a, a misconception can often be is that ETH2 is going to lower gas costs. It really isn't going to. But we will be moving from the proof of work system, which is the energy consumption hog, over to the proof of stake. So energy usage and, and that sort of ecological uh, claim will be reduced by about 99%. So that is interesting. Yeah, and assumably the speed will come along with that in the proof of, of stake network, right? Because uh, you mentioned speed as being one factor as well. Right. right. Uh, tell me, so we had a few questions around market cap and number of coin holders. Um, I know it's just speculation, but like, wh where is the market cap today? Where do we expect it to go? Uh, and same thing with coin holders. How many people are holding Apollo Inu tokens? And what do we expect to see yeah. in the near future. Well, I think you know I'll answer the former, but not the latter. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, uh, certainly in terms of market cap right now, I, I think we're a little bit over 100 million uh, market cap, um, which, you know, bodes well to, you know, people's belief in this vision, I think, and their ability to hold through a very tough market right now across the board, whether it's fiat or crypto, it's there's some challenges out there, right? Um, you know, and, and to do that in a very short order, a uh, quick period of time. Um, you know, number of holders, I think we're sitting about around 3,500. Is that right, Zach? I, I, somewhere in that range um, of holders at this point. Um, again, that's, that's a great number ratio between that and the market cap. And so, you know, you could extrapolate that out. I think our biggest thing for going after holders is going to be people that want to support, you know, creators in this use case. And part of the overall design of the, this token is focused on, you know, that inherent uh, growth that's going to occur when a creator wants to solicit their friends, family, networks to be able to support them in a vote to go out there and educate and bring new people into the Apollo ecosystem, which will add you know new holders because they're required to hold Apollo to participate in in that vote um, or as a creator. So uh, you know it's all part of the design of this to make sure it's still fair and the voting is fair and you don't have to hold a ton of Apollo in your wallet to participate. But you still need to have some skin in the game uh, for all this. So you, you can imagine now when we got, you know, one contest running per week and then we scale it up in a couple months to, you know, maybe a few contests running per week with different genres and the words starting to get out there. We happen to get listed on some some additional exchanges. So that's, you know, bringing more people into it. And it's important to note that exchanges are more about like. Uh, getting people knowledgeable about the token, getting them comfortable to trade in the environment they want to, and then they make the decision of whether they want to move some of it out into DeFi to participate uh, in the use case, right? Because there's different stakeholders. Oh, yeah. there's, there's a stakeholder of, I want to be an investor, uh, and I believe in this token. There's the, the stakeholder that says, I'm a creator, and I want to participate in the community and potentially win prizes. And then there's the voting stakeholder, which we're... After our initial release of the platform, and we proved that each week by week contest is working. We're going to kind of shift the focus on the voters and what award system do, do we implement for them to really be incentivized to participate each week. That is a good note that to participate in the voting for creators for who's going to win and get the funding, uh, it, that will have to be using a DeFi wallet. Correct. So it won't, it, you won't be able to 
only have your Apollo tokens on BitMart or L Bank or the other right. ones that are upcoming. That's yeah, and I mean, there's a technical reason for that. I mean, obviously, yeah, right. Yeah, they, they, you don't have typically you don't have an individual wallet with a public address in a centralized exchange. So that that's the key. You need to own your own keys to your own crypto in a DeFi wallet, and then you can make choices about how you move and what DApps you participate in through that. I gotcha. So we're about seventy days in market cap, uh, over a hundred million holders, around thirty five hundred. I haven't done any research to see how that compares to other tokens, but that seems significant. You know what? Have a better idea. Funny, of that funny thing is, I mean, I, I'm not like ignorant to the competition, I guess, or, or other people that are participating in the community coin space. But we don't really, we don't, we don't look around. I think as much as other people do. It's like we we have something in front of us and goals to accomplish, and like we want to be transparent and communicate with our community that's bringing in. But you know, I don't know. Maybe someone else has hit those KPIs and is doing great and good for them. But I, I, I've been taught all throughout my career that it's just like you, you focus on what's in front of you, not what's on the sides of you. And the next yeah. thing you know, nothing's on the side of you. That that's interesting. It reminds me of the kind of the talk in the startup world around uh, pay attention. You know, pay attention to what you're doing and focus on that, and not what your competitors are doing. Right. Exactly. That's the best way to get ahead. Let's step over to the um, the co the contest and the voting uh, and creators in general. People have a few questions around that, sure. uh, mostly around like what beyond just submitting for the the weekly or the the contest to win funding. Um, what what else are we offering for creators, or what can creators expect to find? Or, or in this community of Apollo? Yeah, my, my vision for that is, um, you know, like I said at the beginning when I was telling kind of the foundation story is, you know, they, they could find constructive feedback and encouragement. I mean, there, there's a whole other side to creativity beyond the financing needed to support their goals and dreams. But there, there's also this kind of emotional and feedback uh, support. And, you know, one, one other kind of soft benefit I think that I see for all of them having is like learning how to present themselves in a way where they have to pitch their project, solicit people that are interested in it, get feedback of what is interesting for that and evolve it. You know, I, I keep coming back to like something like American Idol, right? It's like you hear these stories on season eight or nine or whatever about the person that came in season one and they were really excited and passionate, but the community just decided that wasn't the right project for that particular contest. And they got feedback from the judges and the community and things like that. And they said, well, I'm going after it again. I'm going to do it this time. And I refined my pitch and I, I did some different things to my work or whatever it might be. Right. And mm -hmm. then you have the story of this person that made it after the third time. And if we can kind of you know, replicate that model. I just think you have these amazing inspirational stories that draw additional creators to it. And then eventually, or, you know, I think it's already happening right now. You have established creators that, you know, look at this as like, man, this is powerful. This is kind of changing the way that, you know, whether it's Hollywood gets funded or the music industry or something like that in discovering talent. And it becomes this right. talent pool that all these established creators, like on The Voice, want to be associated with. I mean, imagine right. if each of these subgenres eventually have like a established creative sponsor that, you know, helps them on the preliminaries before they, they submit to vote. I mean, there's there's so much opportunity. There's so much scale and so many directions that this could go into. And I just think that the established creators are going to have a heart for the idea of like, it was hard for me coming up. I, I wish I had a platform that provided guidance, funding, community support and funding. And, and, and that's really that's really the mission here. Hmm. Let's uh, talk about security for a moment. Uh, we we had some questions around. You know, almost every other day we're hearing about this token being hacked or this NFT project is a rug pull. How does Apollo Inu uh, counter the the hackers out there? Um, and then tell us about. Has there been any kind of security auditing or hardening of the, of the yeah. contracts? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think, yeah, common sense and being careful, obviously, I'll just state that. But, you know, education, like I said a minute ago, is really important that we have a responsibility to just protect our community and, and all those around, all those around us. We're community members too, but, you know, we're, we're constantly learning and evolving on that. But yeah, it starts with having a doxed team that people trust and see that have a background and experience in software development and delivering mission critical software like we have. I mean, we're talking, you know, Fortune 100 companies that we've built, sophisticated, everything from e-commerce systems to live streaming to millions of homes in any given minute. I mean, it doesn't get more real uh, in, in terms of the pucker of uh, making sure you're secure and, and you know, functional uh, than that and what we've experienced in the past. Um, so just employing those principles uh, across the board when we develop anything but then it's, um, you know, going through the audit processes, you know, whether it's CERTIC or whether it's, uh, you know, we use Soken uh, for the beginnings of this token for the token contract, which is the company that did Shiba Inu's uh, audit. So we got a perfect score okay. on our audit uh, through them. And we have that all po posted in the white paper and on the website. Um, you know, those are protectionary mechanisms, having the experts say that these guys are up and up. We've done background checks. There's nothing in here. They're squeaky clean. Like, and then you, then you have to earn the rest. Then it's just about going to the community every day and participating and building trust. And people know, people can sense when there's a person that's, you know, you know, shaky or shady or is getting ready to do something. And, and then, it, then it just becomes like a great QA process, like what's happening right now across the, the, the Dow 2.0 proposal is just running it through all these sophisticated unit tests and then these combined tests and Zach's team is is just pounding on this thing uh, to make sure that it's you know 99% of the way there when we get the beta and we'll always find things or always be holes but there are some holes that we don't ever want to experience and that's basically the security of everyone's uh, funds and the Dow funds and things like that that come into our ecosystem so obviously our eyes are on that and um you know, that's that's one of the reasons that we pick the main chain and just we're going to focus there and we'll, we'll choose security. Now we have I didn't mention this a minute ago, but we also have some interesting ways we can get to in a minute um, of how we're helping save on the gas, even though, you know, we're on Ethereum for for those people that want to participate in voting. But hopefully that answers your security question. Yeah. And I think I can probably say for the entire community, like we thank you all for being so early to dox yourselves and, and show who you really are. And, uh, you know, we know your background that you were working at bottle rocket for, as an EVP for a while and all the things that you've done there and your history, like you've been very open with that. Um, and not, not all teams do that. Um, but around kind of the, the shady stuff and that, that we hear about and worry about, um, there's some questions around advertising and, and paying other influencers. Has sure. it, are do y'all pay any influencers? Ones that were uh, specifically called out were Your Pop and Hinock, and I know there's a couple other that are really big into the Apollo Inu token. Yeah, no, we 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 set a standard very early that you know I, I think there's some some stories circulating right about like. You know, an influencer that, you know, shills a product out of not genuine uh, attachment, like the public picks up on that and it doesn't make any difference. So why would I pay money to have something shilled that's un unauthentic um, when when you see what they're really doing out of their heart and passion and where they want to put their own money in is going to be 100 times more genuine. I'd rather grow extremely slow and have it be genuine when we find the right people than try and place some false accelerant on what we're doing here that just that cheapens and minimizes the true nature and passion of what we're building. So no, we have we have not paid one influencer a dime to support or shill or whatever you want to call it our project. We're just we're not built that way. We didn't come that from that kind of um, environment where you know I understand they have a job and they need to make money and I respect that and I have a lot of respect for a lot of the guys because they've helped build this industry, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but for us, it's more about, you know what, if we're, if we're doing things to be above board and, and honest, we would always disclose that. And it doesn't mean we're not doing marketing. It doesn't mean that we're not finding strategic ways to go after people, but 
our approach is going to be spending those dollars to be able to market to the people that benefit from the use case. We, we want people in here that are really the creatives that are reaching out to their networks to bring more creatives in uh, to be able to do it. We feel like all the other stuff is going to work itself out in terms of the virality of the messaging and things like that. If we're on AMAs every week and just being honest and telling about people and on the discords and the telegrams and, you know, uh, working with reputable PR companies uh, for our launch and doing the things that we're going to do, you know, I, I feel like the tide's in our favor. Um, I, I just, it's just a really a personal decision. I'm not knocking any token that makes that decision. Obviously, it's a fine line and you have to decide, you know, um, as a consumer, where, where do you want to, you know, where do you want to invest your, your heart and your time in, um, you know, based on what you, what you hear and what you believe. And I think a lot of them are, are straight up and they're, they're telling you exactly what they believe, but it's just not the, just not the path that we felt like was the right one for us on this project. Okay. So I think we got the answer, but to be clear, yes or no, have you paid any influencers? No, we have not paid any influencers. No. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir.